Okay, it's nine o'clock, we'll get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin On. I'm a laparoscopy uh, endourology fellow at UCSF. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Gore. Uh, he's associate press professor from University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Gore is an endowed, uh, has an, uh, is an urologic oncologist and health services researcher by trade, uh, but also holds an endowed professorship in prostate cancer research. Uh, with interest focusing on patient-centered outcomes in translational oncologic research. Uh, Dr. Gore will be speaking to us today about advanced kidney cancer, uh, an avid educator and role model. Uh, Dr. Gore played a significant part in my residency education. Um, I always learn something new from his talks and I'm looking forward to hearing from today. So Dr. Gore, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Justin. It's great to see you again. Uh, thank you guys for organizing uh, what um, have been fantastic sessions. Um, you know, we were just talking about how this idea of sort of collaborative education, it's, it's long overdue. It just took a pandemic to make it happen. So thank you for organizing these, these sessions. I hope this is helpful today. Um, I just try to think of, of where I could contribute given the talks that were already scheduled. And um, I know sometimes advanced kidney cancer is a little bit more difficult when you think about things like the SASP or other formats in which we um, are trying to learn about advanced kidney cancer, but also importantly for us as urologists, how to take care of advanced kidney cancer patients. I apologize that I'm geared up. I'm, I'm on call today, and so I, I had to go to the OR this morning, so sorry about that. Um, so it, it, this is going to go through a couple of different parts. Um, I do have just some basic disclosures. Um, I am on the NCCN guidelines panel for kidney cancer, which I guess is a disclosure. Um, I had a couple objectives in just thinking about how to structure the talk. Um, and so um, we're gonna talk a little bit about guideline management of advanced kidney cancer. Um, I think you know, risk stratification is something that we use pretty commonly in the management of advanced kidney cancer, similar to you know, using uh, uh, risk stratification in prostate cancer or non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, sometimes it helps um, guide how you think about patients, how you make decisions about patients, um, toward improving their kind of overall clinical outcomes and, and quality of life. Um, and then, you know, we are surgeons. And so I want to talk about uh, the role of surgery in the care of patients with advanced kidney cancer, because that is clearly um, an evolving area of management um, and our intersection with advanced kidney cancer patients. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about localized kidney cancer and the use of systemic therapy in localized kidney cancer with a focus on neoadjuvant therapy, um, adjuvant therapy, and then the rest of the talk is going to be focused on metastatic kidney cancer. Um, with respect to localized kidney cancer, you know, it's important to think about systemic therapy just because um, metastases at presentation are, are really common, unfortunately, um, and that um, uh, epidemiology hasn't changed a lot. Uh, it seems like the rising incidence of kidney cancer is mostly mediated through uh, a growth in diagnoses of small renal masses, uh, but our, our um, prevalent diagnoses of metastatic disease haven't changed a whole lot in the last 20 years. Um, cytotoxic therapies like chemotherapy um, aren't typically helpful in kidney cancer, uh, but with newer therapies, it, it makes sense that as our treatments get better, our ability to use these treatments in localized kidney cancer conceptually uh, should, should be better as well, in theory. Um, so why neoadjuvant? Well, you know, there are really kind of two priorities oftentimes when we're considering neoadjuvant systemic therapy. Um, one is patients that have locally advanced disease that is surgically unresectable. And so to try to take the unresectable and make it resectable. And then in patients, especially those with obligatory indications like a solitary kidney to potentially facilitate nephron sparing uh, surgery. Um, so does it work? Um, so this graph is showing you mainly therapies from the targeted therapy era of management of advanced kidney cancer, so sort of 2005 to 2018 about. Um, and um, in general, the ability of these therapies to have a pronounced effect on the primary, um, it's not universally negligible, but in general, the ability of these therapies to shrink primary tumors more than you know, 20% is, is not great. Um, and so, you know, the idea of using these treatments as a, an intentional neoadjuvant therapy, um, you can do it, and it seems to have some general reduction in the size of the primary, um, but it's not as if 
it's going to take um, something that is largely unresectable and give you a good degree of pre-specified um, likelihood that it's going to make it resectable. Um, <clears throat> the group at MD Anderson also looked at, at the role of these treatments in reducing IVC thrombi to make them more amenable to surgical resection or maybe amenable to a, a, a less big surgical resection. And similarly, um, the expected kind of regression of the thrombus was not as impressive as you would hope. Um, we've all seen, you know, impressive cases. Um, uh, I have a woman in my practice who had a thrombus to the atrium, who for other reasons couldn't have surgery right away, and her uh, thrombus on sutent, sunitinib actually regressed all the way to the renal vein to where she was able to have a minimally invasive surgery. That is a unique case, uh, not a routine case. Um, so what about adjuvant treatment? There's been a lot of focus on adjuvant treatment, and um, much like, you know, our consideration for adjuvant treatment in other cancers like breast cancer, colorectal cancer, maybe bladder cancer. Um, the idea is to treat micrometastatic disease so that we delay or even um, obviate uh, the presentation of distant metastases. And so this is just a table showing you a number of the trials that have been published in the last five, five, 10 years. And you can see that the therapies that have published out have been ma mainly therapies in the targeted um, therapy era. Uh, Durantuximab is an anti-CA9 monoclonal antibody. Uh, but in general, you can see a lot of um, non-differences uh, between um, uh, uh, adjuvant treatments like sunitinib, serafinib, pizopinib, and placebo. And so in general, when we look at the landscape of um, adjuvant options for um, locally advanced kidney cancer, uh, there doesn't appear to be uh, a, an obvious go-to therapy. Um, and so the one trial that reported out as positive was the S-TRAC trial. Um, which showed uh, an improvement in disease-free survival for sunitinib. They have not reported out overall survival, and so some um, agencies and guidelines bodies um, continue to consider this um, a lower level of evidence recommendation for use of sunitinib as an adjuvant therapy. Um, a number of trials are currently um, uh, underway to look at some of the newer therapies. So it makes sense that some of these uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which appear to be um, more cytotoxic than cytostatic, like some of the targeted therapies, that they might be more helpful, more successful as an adjuvant treatment. And so there are a number of studies underway to look at atezolizumab, pembrolizumab, combination uh, immune checkpoint inhibition, um, and, um, and we'll know more about the success uh, or failure of these therapies in the next couple of years. Um, so um, a lot of people, you know, don't know how to answer questions about adjuvant therapy based on sort of S-TRAC and ASSURE, and, and the ASSURE trial looked at sunitinib, serafinib, and placebo and showed no difference. The S-TRAC trial looked at sunitinib and placebo. They did have different patient populations, um, so one specifically focused on clear cell RCC patients, that was the S-TRAC trial. Um, you know, if you dilute your population of patients who are anticipating adjuvant therapy with lower risk cancers like T1B, T2A cancers, it might um, decrease a uh, potential difference in treatments, and so the S-TRAC trial focused on higher risk cases, T3, T4 cases, and there were some dosing differences as well. Um, there was a, 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 a post hoc analysis of the ASSURE trial where they specifically looked at patients who met um, S-TRAC indications, um, and they weren't able to replicate the same difference between sunitinib and placebo, even in the higher risk patients that mass, matched the S-TRAC patient population. So in our practice locally, we talked to patients about sunitinib, um, it can be a poorly tolerated therapy, even when only given for a year, but we mainly focus on patients with, with T3, T4 tumors or resected uh, metastatic disease, uh, where you render them NED for metastatic disease, but also patients who are younger, um, patients who have good performance status, and obviously patients who have clear cell RCC. The main, the main thing that we try to steer patients toward, frankly, um, are these, our clinical trials um, for consideration of, of adjuvant therapy. Um, so what about um, metastatic uh, kidney cancer? And so I'm going to focus the rest of the time on metastatic kidney cancer. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about risk stratification. So there are different ways for you to think about um, your patients and, and how their risk category can influence some of your decision making around initial management. So the most popular risk stratification um, uh, uh, criteria that are 
used these days are the IMDC criteria or the HANG criteria. Um, and these were an update to the Mozart criteria from Sloan Kettering that were from the interferon era and the IMDC criteria are from the targeted therapy era. And you can look at the criteria that are included um, uh, in that second bullet point. One of the main drivers of risk categorization is performance status. So as patients go from um, excellent performance status to moderate performance status to poor performance status, that is a big driver of their risk categorization. And another one is just time to metastatic disease. So to be favorable risk, you have to have no risk factors. And so that means you progress from localized disease to metastatic disease. If you have metastatic disease at presentation, you're automatically intermediate risk. Some of the laboratory abnormalities um, are listed. And some people are looking at sort of modifications to these laboratory values. So rather than looking at, for example, absolute neutrophil count, looking at um, um, uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, things that might give you a better understanding of, of risk categorization. The category that appears to be the most heterogeneous among these are intermediate risk patients. And so it looks like within intermediate risk patients, those with only one risk factor do a lot better in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival than those who have two risk factors. So um, rather than kind of grouping everyone together, or even just looking at whether they have one risk factor like metastatic disease at presentation that drives them into the intermediate risk patient population where they actually might more replicate a favorable risk patient um, compared with those patients that have two risk factors where they, they clearly have worse progression-free and overall survival outcomes. So within that intermediate risk category, there appears to be a lot of heterogeneity. And so the count of risk factors or the weight of the different risk factors may matter. Um, as surgeons, sometimes we try to use risk stratification to make decisions about um, whether we should be doing surgery. And so you might see um, studies that even use the CULP criteria or the MD Anderson criteria for selection for cytoreduction. Um, and so the idea was to take patients in the interferon and targeted therapy era and look at some risk factors for patients who did better or who did worse um, differentially um, with a cytoreductive nephrectomy compared with medical therapy um, alone. And so some of the factors that appear to be associated with less benefit from cytoreduction included um, a couple of lab values, so their albumin level, um, their LDH, and then some specific clinically actionable things like uh, the staging of the primary tumor, whether they had symptomatic metastases, that was an adverse prognostic factor, and then specific metastatic sites. So we know that um, in addition to bone metastases, which are very commonly symptomatic metastatic sites, liver metastases and lymph node metastases confer to more adverse prognosis and would tend to make you steer toward um, initial systemic therapy compared with consideration of a cytoreductive nephrectomy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later in the talk about sort of contemporary selection for cytoreduction because a lot of what we used to do has changed pretty remarkably in the last year or two. Um, this is just kind of a cool thing. Um, so Annabella Disho, who is faculty at, at UCSF, um, is, is a, a dynamo with graphic visualizations of data. And he was inspired by um, this concept of parallel coordinates. And so you see it here as a way to show um, different drivers of, of um, gas mileage uh, economy in cars. And can we apply a visualization scheme like this to better help our patients? And so he constructed something like this for metastatic kidney cancer, which um, uses the IMDCB data, IMDC data. And so you can see all the different criteria components um, included on this parallel coordinates graph. And then the output is survival. And as you select among these different categories, like for example, using performance status. So you can see here a box around um, good performance status patients. You can see that in addition to just seeing sort of a median survival, you actually can see individual life trajectories. So you can look graphically at how many patients lived more than four years, you know, how many patients had um, uh, exceptional survival. Um, and then it gives you a real-time update to the median survival time. So as I decrease the performance status using this slider to 60 to 80, um, you can see the survival time drops dramatically from 50.8 months to 15.6 months. Um, so what about um, therapeutic decision-making and first-line systemic therapy in advanced kidney cancer? So this is uh, the most recent update to the NCCN guidelines. And so 
you can see that they do it in, um, in a histology stratified and risk stratified way. So I'm going to focus mainly on the more prevalent patient population, those patients with uh, clear cell advanced kidney cancer. Um, and you can see different preferred regimens for favorable risk versus intermediate and poor risk. And that um, speaks a little bit to the patient selection for the trials uh, that were used in some of the seminal phase three trials for these drugs. Um, and so because axetinib and pembrolizumab were really, um, uh, it was the, the one therapy that was compared against sunitinib that had inclusion of uh, a number of um, favorable risk patients, uh, they get designation as a, a preferred regimen in favorable risk clear cell histology. But you still see inclusion of targeted therapies such as sunitinib and fizopinib for favorable risk uh, metastatic kidney cancer. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about combination regimens um, and combination regimens that include immune checkpoint inhib inhibitors because these have been um, true game changers in the management of advanced kidney cancer. And then you can see also the inclusion of cabozantinib as a preferred regimen for intermediate and poor risk patients. Um, so what about IL-2? Um, there were always a lot of SASP questions on IL-2 for years and years and years. High-dose IL-2 was the only approved therapy for um, uh, FDA approved therapy for metastatic kidney cancer. Um, IL-2 was sort of a swing and a miss therapy. Um, it was a very expensive treatment that required an ICU admission. And ideally you would get those patients through about 14 doses. Um, and ideally you would get them through two, if not three cycles. Um, the response rates you can see are, are pretty low. But for the longest time, it was really the only uh, therapy that had even a, a minuscule shot at a cure. And the published rates of cures in, in selected patients range from 5% to about 10%. Um, and the, the largest sample is from the NCI, which included a 7% a cure rate. Uh, but the treatment itself was, was pretty morbid uh, with a mortality rate of 4%. So you really had to focus on really highly selected patients, young patients, those with excellent performance status, no um, uh, lung dysfunction, no heart dysfunction, clear cell histology, uh, so no non-clear cell types, um, and then importantly, no prior therapy. And so there was a, a great paper out of uh, the Dana-Farber that showed that patients that got IL-2 after tyrosine kinase inhibitors like sunitinib had remarkably high rates of fatal or near fatal uh, arrhythmias. And so we saw that in our own practice here at UW where we had a couple patients develop BTAC uh, and even uh, a V-fib arrest uh, who had had even remote exposure to sunitinib and then were getting IL-2. And so the kind of dictum with IL-2 was always better never than late. Um, and then um, if you look at the patients that had durable um, disease-free survival after IL-2 in the NCI uh, series, they all had cytoreductive nephrectomies. So it was always a preference to, to take the kidneys out on these patients. And, and the reason we gave it is it works. So this is a patient of mine who had some uh, small volume lung uh, metastases, who also had a fairly large primary. Um, and you can see uh, post IL-2, his disease uh, shriveled up and disappeared. He unfortunately was not a durable responder, uh, but he was NED for a couple of years after his IL-2 treatment. Um, they say it's like having the worst flu of your life. Um, and so you can see his incredibly edematous uh, legs with sort of this um, scaly rash all over his legs. And so it was a pretty miserable treatment to get. Um, but when it worked, it worked. And so you can see that um, when you look at the responders, the patients who had a complete response, their um, survival was durable, even 20 years. Um, and so these are the patients that you could say were truly cured of their metastatic kidney cancer. So in, uh, uh, in the sort of aughts of the 2000, I don't know what you call that decade, um, you know, one of the big game changers was the emergence of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors for the management of metastatic kidney cancer. Um, and so this is sort of the seminal sunitinib versus interferon alpha paper that showed uh, a remarkably improved progression-free survival for sunitinib compared with interferon alpha. And so sunitinib rapidly became uh, the primary first-line treatment for metastatic kidney cancer. Um, <clears throat> Pazopinib um, also has a first-line um, indication. And when pazopinib was compared with sunitinib, uh, there appeared to be uh, no significant difference in progression-free survival between pazopinib and sunitinib, but it was a much more well-tolerated therapy. So when you looked at um, quality of life of patients who were getting pazopinib compared with uh, sunitinib, uh, 
uh, you see a lot less fatigue for bisoponib patients, a lot less um, hand and foot soreness, um, which is a common side effect of these therapies. And so it appears that maybe pizoponib was associated with people better able to stay on therapy, which is important adjunct to survival in, in, in metastatic disease in general. Um, so what about cabozantinib? So um, five years ago, uh, we saw cabozantinib uh, presented against everolimus as a second line therapy in metastatic kidney cancer. And more recently, the phase two cabozone trial, which compared cabozantinib to sinitinib and showed uh, superior progression-free survival to cabozantinib. Um, one of the things that was really remarkable about uh, the phase three trial is a second line therapy for cabozantinib is that most treatments for metastatic kidney cancer have traditionally stratified in their response rates by patient risk category. So for example, um, the response rates to sinitinib drop dramatically when you go from favorable risk to intermediate risk to poor risk patients. But uh, the cabozantinib um, phase three trial against Everlimus showed uh, that the treatment was fairly agnostic to uh, metastatic tumor site and to risk category. And so they saw um, good responses irrespective of risk category and irrespective of high risk metastatic sites like liver and bone. And so um, for some patients, um, uh, we made decisions based on first line therapy, based on uh, the site of of metastatic disease. And so if they had some adverse site disease, they would be routed toward cabozantinib as an initial treatment. And then uh, the game changer, the use of combination therapies in advanced kidney cancer. Um, and so in 2018, uh, Checkmate 214 uh, published out, and this was using a combination of nivolumab with ipilimumab. So immune checkpoint inhibitors act on uh, the, the couplet of uh, receptors on T cells with uh, proteins on target cells. And in general, you know, what these drugs do is, is they turn off the off switch. So you know, we are programmed to have these off switches on our T cells so that we don't attack healthy cells. Um, you know, that's one of the things that can go awry in, in uh, autoimmune disorders. And so cancer has a way of sometimes outsmarting our immune response to cancer. Um, and so we turn off the off switch and that reactivates our immune system to fight the cancer. And so nivolumab and ipilimumab target PD-1 and CTLA-4. And the combination was uh, measured against sunitinib in metastatic kidney cancer. And um, you can see here, looking at overall survival, a pretty early and remarkable um, stratification between the overall survival of patients getting combination nivolumab and ipilimumab where the median survival hadn't yet been reached um, versus sunitinib. Um, and some um, remarkable things that sort of changed the landscape of care for metastatic kidney cancer. The main thing was this, this complete response rate. So 9% uh, complete response rate to combination of olimab and um, which was the first time we had seen uh, a substantial complete response rate to any um, systemic therapy in metastatic kidney cancer other than um, IL-2. And, Nivolumab and ipilimumab are, are much more easily tolerated than high-dose IL-2 treatment. You can see the overall response rate uh, was much better with combination immunotherapy compared with sunitinib, um, and, uh, and uh, the durability of these responses seemed to be also um, impressive, that those patients who had CRs um, had durable responses. What about quality of life? So sunitinib can be a hard therapy um, to take. Um, and so there are a lot of dose reductions when people are getting sunitinib, um, dose interruptions um, and discontinuations. Um, and so what you see here is the change in baseline in a kidney cancer specific quality of life instrument called the FKSI. Um, and um, patients on sunitinib had a decrease, which means their quality of life went down, a decrease over time on the treatment, um, whereas patients who were getting combination of olimab and ipilimumab had improvement in their quality of life that seemed to persist over the two years on the study. Um, <clears throat> uh, what about um, other combination treatments? And so um, pembrolizumab uh, is an immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, paired with axitinib, which is a ty tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And so looking at overall survival, you can also see an early and impressive stratification and improved overall survival for pembrolizumab axitinib patients compared with what was at the time the standard first-line treatment, um, which was sunitinib. 
and that hazard ratio for death of 0 0.53 is, is pretty remarkably impressive. But if you look at this forest plot on the right hand side, you can see that that improved um, hazard ratio for death is sort of um, universal for all subgroups as well. Um, and so if you just look at this area right here where it looks at IMDC risk category, for a lot of these therapies among favorable risk patients, you see that sunitinib patients actually do pretty well and that's why the confidence intervals cross one. But for intermediate and poor risk patients, uh, the combination of pembrolizumab and exhibited exitinib was clearly superior uh, to sunitinib. And like many of the immune checkpoint inhibitor studies that we've seen in, in various cancers, including bladder cancer, um, the combination appears to be agnostic to performance status. So you can use it in patients with uh, poor performance status. Um, in terms of um, response rates, so uh, pembrolizumab and exitinib was associated with a pretty impressive um, overall response rate, which groups um, partial responses and complete responses. The complete response rate was a little bit lower, and again, this is not a head-to-head -head study, so just compared with sunitinib, it was a little bit lower than the complete response rate with nivolumab and ipilimumab, but still a 6% complete response rate is, is incredibly impressive. And so um, it appears to be an incredibly well-tolerated therapy that can be given even to patients with uh, reduced performance status um, and allows you to, to do some swings for the fences as well. So this is just sort of a, a summary of the different first-line therapies for metastatic kidney cancer. And you can see that the response rate uh, for the tyrosine kinase inhibitors is much lower uh, than the response rates for combination treatments uh, that incorporate an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And you also see a large leap in progression-free survival where it's about nine months for the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and it goes up to a year or a year and change for um, the combination immunotherapies. Discontinuation is a problem, and so sometimes we make decisions based on the adverse event profile and the likelihood of patients remaining on therapy. And the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab has treatment-related AE discontinuations that are similar to the TKI monotherapies, so around 20%. Um, but um, some of the newer combinations like pembrolizumab and exitinib or uh, avelumab and exitinib have much lower discontinuation rates and are much more well tolerated as combination therapies. Um, so what about surgery? Um, uh, post uh, sunitinib in sort of this, this new targeted therapy era, it became sort of default that we would do cytoreductive nephrectomy in anticipation of initiating systemic therapy. And it wasn't universal. Um, we knew that poor risk patients uh, did worse when we prioritized uh, doing surgery first. Um, but, um, you know, uh, more recently, uh, the, the, um, the critical evaluation of the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy has been highlighted uh, here. Um, and so, um, in terms of uh, uh, the benefit of cytoreduction, um, you know, in theory, um, part of the benefit of cytoreduction uh, was that um, way back when, uh, there were these unique cases of spontaneous regressions of metastatic disease. And so there was some interplay between the primary and metastatic sites that we didn't quite understand. Um, and so there was this foundational SWOG trial that compared cytoreductive nephrectomy followed by interferon with interferon alone and showed a survival benefit to those patients that, that got cytoreductive nephrectomy. That led to all the trials with tyrosine kinase inhibitors to incorporate uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy before treatment as one of the inclusion criteria for a lot of those trials. So if you look at those trials, 90%, 95% of patients had a cytoreductive nephrectomy first. But it makes sense that as our therapies get better and better, more effective and more effective, that the marginal benefit of doing a cytoreductive nephrectomy goes down. And so this was a European trial that compared uh, sunitinib alone with nephrectomy followed by sunitinib. Um, and you can see actually that the overall survival and the progression-free survival was actually worse in the patients who um, had a nephrectomy first. And it, you know, I think it, it, um, it definitely has some flaws. Um, so if you look at the patient population that was included in this study, um, it was definitely oversampled with poor risk patients. Uh, poor risk patients are patients that we by default probably would not include 
um, in our decision making for SIDA reduction. Um, and so that was sort of uh, overfilling the pot with patients that we knew were predisposed to adverse outcomes, sorry. Um, a couple other things, if you think about those CULP criteria, uh, a lot of the patients that were in the nephrectomy arm um, had T3 or T4 uh, primary tumors, which might be associated with decreased marginal benefit from cytoreductive nephrectomy. And then, you know, one thing that, that um, was talked about in, in a bygone era was sort of the relationship between the burden of cancer and the primary tumor relative to the global burden of kidney cancer. And so when you see the median primary tumor uh, size of around eight, eight and a half centimeters, that makes you wonder about the relative burden of the primary and the metastatic disease in these patients. And some of them definitely had um, adverse metastatic sites, including bony metastases, lymph node metastases, and liver metastases. So this may not be a patient population that was ideally selected for consideration of cytoreduction. That being said, it makes sense that in patients with metastatic disease, our priority should be treating the metastatic disease. And so when we prioritize cytoreduction first, we're deferring systemic therapy for a systemic illness. And I think one benefit of this trial was it, it forced us to critically evaluate um, the role and the timing of cytoreduction in the care of metastatic kidney cancer patients. So what do we do? Um, so it used to be, and it still is true, that in patients with resectable metastases, we prioritize surgery first. That's not always the case, and I'm gonna show you an example of how we made sort of a, a different decision um, in, um, in a patient that kind of meets that criteria. Um, and then for intermediate risk patients, right? Because favorable risk patients likely already have their primary removed and poor risk patients didn't benefit anyway from cytoreduction. So those weren't patients that we typically considered for cytoreductive treatment. But in intermediate risk patients, we looked for those patients with a dominant primary tumor in small volume metastases, especially those patients that had favorable sites of metastatic disease. So if they had you know, a 15 centimeter primary in small volume lung metastases, those are patients that we would strongly have favored for cytoreductive nephrectomy. Definitely when we had to do it as a precursor to a clinical trial or when we were using a lot more IL-2, or you know, even though the CULP criteria mentioned T3 and T4 being um, uh, high risk for lack of benefit of cytoreduction, um, sometimes when that patient is at risk for symptomatic progression or has an IBC thrombus that we know has a potentially marginal um, benefit uh, in terms of regression of the thrombus with systemic therapy, uh, we sometimes prioritize cyber reduction first, but more and more now, we defer almost all of these patients to prioritize initiation of systemic therapy. Um, and even patients with resectable metastases, those are resectable radiographic metastases. And so starting them on systemic therapy and then thinking about the timing of a deferred surgical procedure has been more and more the mainstay of our treatment approach these days. So I just wanna show you a couple of case examples. Um, and then hopefully have time for um, a couple questions. Um, I think I went a little faster than I thought I was going to, so we should have plenty of time for questions. This is sort of an example of some, I think, unique historical decision-making, but also uh, the way that management of metastatic kidney cancer has changed so remarkably in the last 15 years. So it used to be that uh, if you had metastatic kidney cancer, we had one treatment that had even a, a, a meager chance of cure. Uh, and the median survival for all patients was less than 12 months. Um, and so it was a, a really challenging diagnosis. And so what we have now are, are options. And so this is a young man who is still alive, uh, but he presented, I think in 2013 or 2014 uh, with metastatic kidney cancer, and he presented uh, with sepsis and multi-organ failure. Um, he was in the ICU at presentation and his creatinine was 5.2. I mean, he had a surgical procedure six months before where he had had labs drawn, so we knew his baseline creatinine uh, was 1.0. I mean, you can see on the CT scan there, his primary tumor in the left kidney, uh, which was about seven and a half centimeters. And then he had other notable sites of disease. He had a paraspinal metastasis that you can see there uh, with possibly some bony involvement. And then he had a number of areas of um, uh, disease in the chest. And so <clears throat> with his renal failure at presentation, um, this was not a patient that we wanted to, to potentially sort of poke the wasp's nest and consider for cytoreduction, even though that was a big part of our workflow back then. Uh, you know, most patients, especially young patients like this guy, we prioritize cytoreduction as a default 
Um, but this was a patient where we, we intentionally deferred. Um, and we really wanted to give him high dose IL-2, but I mentioned that concept of, of better never than late. Well, we didn't want to give him a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and obviate our ability to do that sort of swing for the fences approach with high dose IL-2. So instead, he got a therapy, um, which was a combination of bevacizumab or avastin with interferon. And then we were able to uh, you know, get him out of the hospital. His creatinine came back down to one, and he was able to have a minimally invasive cytoreductive nephrectomy about a month later. <clears throat> and then after he recovered from his surgery, he got IDOS IL-2. Um, and then he kind of walked through the entire algorithmic tree of treatments uh, for metastatic kidney cancer. He was on nivolumab um, for under a year um, and then was able to get um, uh, a metastasectomy of his paraspinal disease. Um, and then because of progression, he switched to Sutent, uh, which uh, was very poorly tolerated. And he switched to Cabozantinib, which he was able to take for more than a year. And then got a combination of Wimbatinib and Bevacizumab, um, which he was able to take for less than a year. And then for the last kind of almost year, he's been on a combination of Pembrolizumab and Exitinib after being on Exitinib monotherapy for um, just about a year. Uh, and so <clears throat> he's still alive, you know, six, seven years later. Um, and he's a, an example sort of of our historical decision-making around cytoreductive nephrectomy. Um, <clears throat> this is sort of a, a more contemporary example. So this is a patient uh, that I initially saw last fall. He is who we would consider to be a young man who presented with flank pain. And on imaging in the ER was found to have not only this large left adrenal mass, which measured about eight centimeters at the time of presentation, but also a large left primary uh, that measured about 12 centimeters. <clears throat> and in addition to that, he had multiple cavitary lesions in the lungs, which were consistent with pulmonary metastases. And so um, this is a gentleman who three, four years ago, for sure, would have gotten an upfront sort of large uh, left-sided uh, cytoreductive surgery, um, followed by, you know, potentially high dose IL-2, given his young age and excellent performance status. Uh, but instead, this is a gentleman that initiated systemic therapy with combination ipilimumab and nivolumab. Um, and with that treatment, uh, he had uh, actual complete resolution of his lung nodules. Um, his primary decreased a little bit, so it decreased from 12 centimeters to about 8 centimeters, and his adrenal metastasis decreased from 8 centimeters to 5 to 6 centimeters. And so he was able to actually have a minimally invasive uh, left radical nephrectomy and adrenalectomy just about a month ago. And the plan is to maintain him on systemic therapy for a year. Um, uh, and, uh, and then do a trial uh, off therapy and see how he does. Um, what about timing of systemic therapy and surgery? So when working with your medical oncology team and thinking about um, how, to, how to time tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we don't use them as much anymore, but mTOR inhibitors like everolimus or temsorolimus, um, and the newer treatments, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, how long do patients have to be off these treatments before you can do a minimally invasive surgery or even a large open operation? And the answer is, is not very long. And so we used to try to time patient surgery to when they were on a break. So with sunitinib, for example, patients were typically on a four and two cycle where they got four weeks of treatment and then a two week break, and then four weeks of treatment and then a two week break. And so we would try to time their, their surgery at the end of their two week holiday. Um, to minimize, you know, concerns about wound healing, concerns about maybe increased thromboembolic events or anesthetic complications. And we learned more and more that that just wasn't a concern. And so patients are, are able to take their sunitinib literally the day before um, surgery uh, and, and do well without any apparent increase in adverse events. With mTOR inhibitors, we typically would give them a two-week break, but that's not as relevant to contemporary kidney cancer practice. But with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, it appears to be analogous to the TKIs where patients can literally have an infusion the day before their surgery and have their surgery the next day um, safely. Um, so what about metastasectomy? Um, so, you know, kidney cancer is one of these unique cancer types. Um, there are others that we think about offhand like uh, colon cancer uh, where patients can have um, oligometastases and have durable disease-free survival with a metastasectomy, with a surgical resection of, of, of a metastasis. And the classic example of kidney cancer is uh, a primary with a solitary lung nodule. And sometimes those patients would get uh, simultaneous surgery or they would get a nephrectomy 
and resection of the of the lung nodule, either through a wedge resection or a lobectomy or whatever it took to do a resection of that solitary lung mass. Um, and you know, the lung remains a favorable site for oligometastasectomy. Um, some other, other favorable sites that we think about include uh, the adrenal gland, uh, the pancreas, um, surprisingly, appears to be a favorable site for oligometastasectomy. Uh, but you know, we, we think about this also on a on a site by site basis. Um, I have a patient who initially presented with uh, T3A clear cell kidney cancer due to a renal vein thrombus, uh, and he was disease free for about three years, and then he developed um, an oligometastasis at the dome of his liver, and he had an ablative procedure, um, and has had no recurrences since. So even with an adverse site like the liver, uh, we would still consider doing an oligometastasectomy, and so. Um, one sort of example of, of decision-making for this, this is a patient who we just saw recently as well, who had his kidney taken out a couple years ago for, and I'm sorry for the extra T there, for T2A clear cell kidney cancer. Um, by all accounts, this is someone who has probably about a 15 to 20% chance of disease recurrence in the five years after his nephrectomy. Um, but he was found about a year later to have a new right adrenal nodule. Uh, retrospectively, uh, you could see something in his adrenal gland uh, back when the outside team did his nephrectomy, um, but um, he clearly had a growing right adrenal nodule. Um, this was biopsy proven uh, metastatic clear cell kidney cancer. Uh, and so um, after a discussion about options, including going right to metastasectomy, he made a decision to initiate systemic therapy in part out of the consideration of, of this being a systemic disease that will at least initially treat systemically and confirm that he doesn't have any emergent metastatic disease. Uh, and he did not, but despite treatment with ipilimumab and nivolumab, his adrenal metastasis um, grew on therapy. And so about six months later, he was found to have an increase in size of his adrenal metastasis to 3.1 centimeters. Uh, and so um, you can see it right here. Here's the undersurface of his liver, and you can see his adrenal nodule right there. Um, and so he was able to have a uh, robotic adrenalectomy um, just a couple weeks ago and is doing really well. Um, and he's going to stay on therapy, on nivolumab monotherapy for another six months and then see if he can stop therapy altogether. Um, so just an example of decision making for metastasectomy. And so um, I have a little more time than I expected for questions, but I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. And you can see my um, email information there as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gray. That was great. Um, we have some questions uh, coming in. Um, uh, a lot of them stem from sort of, you, sort, you touched on this, but uh, your timing for surgery after systemic therapy uh, and also any specific surgical considerations for surgery in these patients, you know, is, it, is there more scarring inflammation, any uh, specific considerations you have to take, you know, compared yeah. to someone who's just um, therapy naive? So one is, is, is actually, and I, I didn't talk about this, but one is when you talk to a patient who you are initiating systemic therapy on with a plan for strong consideration of deferred cytoreduction. So a patient that you say, you know, I think we should try you on systemic therapy for now. You know, we should treat this systemic illness systemically, but um, be hopeful uh, that we could consider doing a cytoreductive nephrectomy or a, or a metastasectomy or, or both. Um, in a certain time frame, with the TKIs with sunitinib, we often thought about a three to four month time frame, sort of, sort of three cycles of therapy, and then surgery. Uh, but with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, we typically think about a six to a nine month time frame. So six to nine months of therapy, followed by surgery. And part of that is because you can get this this early pseudo progression, uh, wherein you know that early three month imaging sometimes over represents. Their, their disease burden and, uh, and you can overcall your concern about progression. So we often um, decide to defer kind of decision-making around surgery till the six month mark. Um, in terms of how these treatments affect our ability to do surgery, I would say it's highly variable. Um, there are patients where you get this sort of weepy uh, edematous um, surrounding inflammation around the kidney um, and, uh, and it can make it a little tricky. Um, not so much so that it should change your decision making based on the anatomy of the kidney. So if you think radiographically it's eligible for, for example, a laparoscopic or robotic procedure, um, you should still do that, but you can get a little bit more of this kind of weeping edema. It's not like what we think about with, for example, testis cancer with intense desmoplastic reactions. I haven't witnessed that, 
Um, but sometimes you go in and you're expecting sort of that weeping edema and that sort of like mild obliteration of planes. And it looks like a de novo surgical procedure. So I would just say it's, it's highly variable. Um, do you counsel your patients that they're more likely to have an open conversion or anything like that, or just not really? I don't. I, I, um, I would say um, that uh, in my experience, um, open conversions are, are pretty rare. Um, I kind of feel like if I feel the patient is eligible for minimally invasive surgery, that's almost always what they're going to get. Um, and so I think if you're making the decision based on sort of their, the radiographic appearance of the primary and your estimation of the size of the primary, the local relationships of the primary to other structures around the kidney. And if based on that, you think they're eligible for a minimally invasive surgery, you can complete a minimally invasive surgery. Okay. Uh, another question we have, um, what are your thoughts on uh, SBRT for locally advanced or unresectable uh, disease? So um, uh, I would say um, that I have not been super impressed uh, with use of SBRT on the primary. Um, and, um, and I'm a little biased about SBRT on the adrenals only because um, I'm the guy that has to then take it out if the SBRT fails. And that is a really challenging operation, like really challenging. So for example, we have patients who come in with, with uh, oligomets to the adrenal. And I have a, a strong preference to do surgery with or without preceding systemic therapy over SBRT, uh, but SBRT to the primary, you know, you're not you're not saving them nephron loss usually. You know, you're radiating the kidney, um, and so I haven't been super impressed with that. Now that's different from SBRT to metastatic sites. And so, for example, we had a trial here called our Immunorads trial, where there's this thing called the Ebscopal effect, where basically the radiation itself. Um, delivers an antigen load to the body that allows you to have sort of a hyper response to immunotherapy. So it sort of kickstarts the immunotherapy and leads to a, a more impressive response to the systemic therapy. Um, and, and we've observed, you know, several cases of that where we've seen impressive responses uh, to the primary as well, but that's different. That's SVRT usually to a, a metastatic site, usually in the lung or in the bones in combination with immunotherapy. Um, I remember one of your talks you gave uh, talking about how the cytoreductive nephrectomy might, the considerations might change now with these immunotherapies coming out compared to, you know, all the old cytonephrective therapies were compared with IL-2, SUTEMS. Uh, are you seeing any evidence that that's, that is changing or studies coming out? Um, um, so um, uh, I would say um, I have not been super impressed with immune checkpoint inhibitors causing major regression of the primary tumor. But you would imagine that as we get therapies that are more effective, that, that our need to do cytoreductive nephrectomy to augment someone's overall cancer care um, is, is lessened. Um, and so I think, you know, I think we all are eagerly anticipating uh, the results of some of these ongoing trials. And so we've been a part of a couple of those. Um, but, um, uh, I don't, I don't know that, um, it changes that dramatically the concept that we won't need to do cytoreductive nephrectomy in the future. I think it more changes the timing of how we consider it. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, sounds like the jury's not out yet. So, um, um, so some other questions just going in order here. Um, you, one of your forest plots showed an equivocal benefit for favorable risk disease with PEMBRO exit nib. Why does the NCCN recommend PEMBRO X for favorable risk groups? Yeah, because it's still, there's still a marginal benefit to pembrolizumab over, over sunitinib. Uh, it's a, a much more well-tolerated therapy and it has a much higher rate of CRs. Uh, and so even though the confidence intervals Cross one, you can see it's not favored over. It's just among the preferred regimens for favorable risk. And really, what that plot tells you is that actually patients with favorable risk metastatic kidney cancer do 
pretty well with sunitinib. And so that's more the take home. And, and that actually bore out in the Checkmate 214 study as well, where the favorable risk patients who got sunitinib did really, really well. Um, and so uh, I think it's more a reflection of, of sunitinib being a, a good therapy for favorable risk metastatic disease than they're not being benefit to pembroaxi in those patients. Um, for, for us, I will say we use a lot more pembroaxi in patients who have performance status limitations, older patients where you're worried about tolerance of therapy, because truly the tolerance of that, that combination is excellent. Patients do really well on it. It's like, it's like all immune checkpoint inhibitors, right? The overwhelming majority of patients do really well. Uh, the ones who have some adverse events can have pretty wicked adverse events, but the overwhelming majority of patients do really well maintaining those therapies. Great, thank you. Um, what do you think is more meaningful, objective response or complete response? Would you take Ipinevo over Pembroax, given that Ipinevo has a higher complete response rate? So this is sort of a what would I do, right? What would I do if this were me? Um, and as you know, Justin, I'm incredibly young and have an amazing performance status. And so um, for me, I, I would. I would take the higher complete response rate. Um, and so I think it's, it's individualized decision-making. And so our, our process, because most of the patients we're seeing in our multidisciplinary kidney cancer clinic are intermediate and poor risk. And so for those intermediate risk patients who have, for example, one risk factor and who have good to excellent performance status, we route those patients toward combination neo ipi And so you can see on those case studies that I presented, for example, you know, the 56-year-old male with kidney, adrenal, and then small volume lung metastases, that patient got ipi nevo. Um, another question here, uh, kind of relating to biopsies before starting these therapies. Um, so they were asked, they were curious as to if those, those patients you presented, the 28 year old and the 56 year old, uh, did they have any biopsies performed prior to starting therapy? Um, yeah. will they follow up and get any genetic testing? Uh, what was in their final pathology yeah. results? So everyone gets a biopsy before initiating systemic therapy, right? Because your decision-making is different. You know, I focus this talk mostly on patients with clear cell uh, metastatic kidney cancer, but your decision-making is different for non-clear cell metastatic kidney cancer. And so um, everyone has to get a biopsy before the initiation of systemic therapy. Um, uh, what was the second part? I'm sorry. Um, role for genetic oh, testing. Genetic testing. Uh, for, those so, for those patients you, you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. So the, the role is greater uh, than it used to be. So, you know, if you look at our guidelines, um, and this is based uh, uh, on a lot of the work that Brian Shuck uh, has done showing sort of the, the population distribution of patients with syndromic RCC versus the population distribution of patients with sporadic RCC. And so there appears to be sort of like a, a gap, a valley um, right around age 46. And so in general, anyone under age 46 who has newly diagnosed kidney cancer, irrespective of, of whether it's localized or metastatic, we route toward genetic testing. But we are more and more testing almost all of our patients who present with metastatic disease. The 28-year-old, you know, he's got metastatic clear cell kidney cancer, and so you would worry about VHL for him, but he ended up just having a, a sporadic metastatic RCC. Um, but yeah, we, we do, it's sort of directed by age, by distribution of disease, clearly by family history, um, and by histology, right? Because the histologies differ depending on the syndrome. And so um, for someone with clear cell metastatic RCC, you're not going to worry about uh, HLRCC, right? Because that's papillary type 2 RCC. So it depends on histology as well. Um, will you switch uh, systemic therapies if they fail one or proceed to cytone reductive nephrectomy? You know, what is your decision tree for yeah. Sort of just, you know, switching therapies. So um, if they have a, a, a symptomatic primary, you would at least think about it. But if someone is failing systemic therapy, doing a local surgery is not going to help them. If they're failing systemic therapy, they need an attempt at a different systemic therapy. Because all you're going to do by taking out their kidney is delay the initiation of their second line systemic therapy. It's kind of like management in the first line as well. And so uh, we learned from Carmina, which was the trial that I showed, that there is harm to delaying systemic therapy for a systemic illness. And there are flaws to that trial, and it's important to know the flaws. But in general, we should treat metastatic disease with systemic therapy. Uh, and so if you are failing at treating the metastatic disease, doing a local treatment is not gonna help them. 
And so that patient needs second line systemic therapy. Great. Um, how often do you utilize cryotherapy and embolization in advanced kidney cancer? Uh, any, uh, is there any role? So uh, I think it, it depends on um, a lot of sort of indi individualized decision making points. Um, and so uh, for management of primary tumors, um, it just depends. So for example, you know, someone who had a nephrectomy remotely, you know, five, six years ago, and now has uh, a metachronous tumor in the other kidney, plus another side of disease like the adrenal gland, for example. You know, that's a patient where we would strongly consider uh, cryotherapy versus other, you know, um, nephron sparing approaches, such as partial nephrectomy, um, depending on the other sites of disease. And so we would use cryotherapy in that case. Uh, cryotherapy for locally advanced kidney cancer doesn't have a tremendous role. Um, for embolization, so we don't use a lot of embolization. Uh, we don't pre-embolize a lot of our patients who are getting an IVC thrombectomy. Um, there are certain situations where anatomically those patients require embolization. And then, you know, in those really unfortunate patients that we see maybe once a year who have Bud Chiari, uh, because their IVC thrombus is a, obstructing their hepatic venous outflow and causing a congestion-based liver failure. Um, you know, the only way to try to save their life is basically through initiation of systemic therapy and embolization. And that's, uh, that's just a, a very hopeful approach, but we don't use a lot of embolization. Embolization of the kidney in that circumstance for the blood care. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, for the last case you presented, uh, if you had known the contralateral adrenal nodule was there, would you have resected it at the time of uh, the nephrectomy on the other side or surveyed it while on chemo? So um, that was actually ipsilateral. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't show you the primary tumor, but his primary tumor was the right kidney. And so he had a right nephrectomy. And, uh, and I, I think if that patient had been treated here, he 100% would have had a nephrectomy and adrenalectomy. Uh, you could see the nodule a couple years ago. Um, if I have a patient who has um, a concern for a primary on one side and the possibility of a contralateral adrenal metastasis, that's a patient where I would biopsy it um, because there I think confirmation of the histology of what's going on in the adren adrenal gland is really important. Um, and if I think the primary can have a minimally invasive surgery, what I typically do is staged minimally invasive surgeries rather than like a big cut, um, just because that's better for their overall recovery. Um, and then we talk to them about, you know, after the biopsy, whether we want to initiate systemic therapy just as we navigate getting them through these two surgeries or not. Um, but, um, but that's where I think biopsy is really helpful. Great. Uh, we're just about out the tight the hour, I think. Um, I think um, and uh, yeah, so the, uh, any unanswered questions will be posted on the Q&A. Um, and we remind people to fill out the lecture evaluations. Um, thanks for tuning in. And um, uh, look for, I think, we have another lecture going at 10 o'clock, at 10, 10, 10 minutes. Awesome. Uh, Thank you so much, Lesson. Nice seeing you. <laughs> nice seeing you as well. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. All right.